Well, thank you very much for that very generous introduction. And uh, I, I'm not sure, but my moment of the week may turn out to be it's the first time anybody's ever described me as a key person in anything. Um, so Nina and I are going to do a joint presentation. Thank you, thank you all very much for inviting me to do this. Uh, it's a funny business. We were years and years and years in the making of this, and it now feels like a great relief. Nina and I both said earlier, we've been back and looked over it today or in preparation for this talk. And um, I actually feel quite, I don't know about Nina, I feel rather satisfied with it. I think in the end, we've done a job that I'm rather pleased with. We talked about it. We thought that actually, some of you may not know quite what nice is and how nice works. So we thought we'd start with talking about that. Nice started originally, in I think a sort of quite a, a, a limited way, it was originally set up to deal with the problem of postcode lottery with, with medicines. And they were just there to give judgment on medicines and they still have the power to say, here's something we approve. And then if they approve it, health authorities have to uh, provide it uh, and fund it. Um, but they then very early got into guidelines. And there was a time, some, I don't know how many years ago, when everybody was producing guidelines. And uh, they produced lots of guidelines, which I think they later recognized were not quite as firmly based on the evidence as they should have been. So they changed it in such a way that they now are very, very strict about um, the sort of evidence they will consider. Um, and so the current approach, and I've put this in just so that you understand something really important about guidelines, which I didn't understand until I started doing this work. They start with a topic, which I think is usually, or sometimes offered to them by the Department of Health. They agree a topic with the Department of Health. And they start with an exercise called scoping, where people meet, in our case, I think for two days, talking about what the problems are in that area and what questions lots of people uh, want answered. And all sorts of stakeholders are invited to these meetings. And I think people can just put their hand up and say, I want to go, and they go. And the reason for, for talking about that is lots of things are decided at that point. And if you're really bothered about guidelines, um, as I am in, in terms of reading them later, actually that's not good enough. You, you know, if you, if you know something's coming up that, that you're really concerned about, you should try and get involved in the scoping exercise. After the scoping, uh, the, the problems get formed and revised into answerable questions. Each question then leads to a review of the literature. And on the basis of the review, the, the reviews are then um, seen and read by the committee that write recommendations on the basis of the reviews. And the bit I've left out, I meant to put it in and then forgot, but I've been reminded, which is the thing then comes out in draft and goes out to stakeholders for consultations. And we got I can't remember, I meant to look, and if I have a moment in discussion, I'll have a look. We got hundreds of, of, of comments back from stakeholders, all of which had to be discussed, some of which we said, no, we dealt with that or something, but, but many of them we responded to. One or two, we, we were very, very grateful that they pointed out a, a bit of, mis not a mistake, but something we hadn't phrased very well or something. I also just wanted to talk a little bit about the composition, the composition of this committee. We, um, the appeal to me of chairing it was that it was very much a multidisciplinary committee. Um, we had midwives, both community-based and hospital-based. We had um, two pediatricians. We had uh, a pediatric, no, not a pediatric, I think a postnatal psychiatrist, anyway, a psychiatrist, um, feeding, infant feeding experts, and the other thing that's really important, and I'm going to come back to it um, later, I think. No, I'll take, I'll say now. <laughs> All nice committees have lay people. So they have, if you have a, 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 a nice guideline committee talking about cirrhosis of the liver, they make sure they have two people on it who've got experience of the condition, who can bring personal experience to bear on the committee. And of course, the thing about this committee is, 
it was large. It was, I don't know, 20 people, maybe, maybe fewer, I don't know, about 20. And almost all of us had had experience of parents. So although there were two people who were officially lay people on the committee, when it suited us, we all went and took, gave the lay view. And I think, I think it, was, it made the work rather easier than it might have been otherwise. I think it gave the committee a sort of coherence that made my job easy. So what did we do? Well, we worked for three years or something. At the end of it, there were various reasons it delayed. The, 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 the lockdown um, was one of the reasons it was delayed, but there were other reasons. They kept expanding the amount of work we had to do. So every time they said, can you do something else? We asked for an extension. When it all came out, I said, is this the longest time? And they said, no, no, one of them is longer, much longer, but we got pretty near to it. We wrote, and what I, all I'm doing here is summarizing. I'm going to go through these slides very, very quickly. These are the headings that if you go to the guideline on the website, you can see. Organization and delivery of care, postnatal care of the woman, postnatal care of the baby, illness in baby, which has its own separate section, and infant feeding, which also has its own separate section, which Nina's going to talk about. We're not going to talk about all of these. So quickly, here are the subsections. Um, I wanted to talk, I will talk later about communication between professionals. This I think is really, really important and I'm gonna come back to that at the end. Nina will probably talk about it as well on the way through. Postnatal care of the woman, uh, assessment and care of the woman, a section on postpartum bleeding and a section on perineal health. Something that, that was a bit new to some of us, certainly to me. Postnatal care of the baby, again, assessment and care, um, a section on bed sharing, which is new to this um, guideline, which I'll be talking about, and a very short, short section on promoting emotional attachment. I'm not going to be talking about that in detail. The interesting thing there was there really isn't an awful lot of evidence and gathering evidence in such a way that it could be synthesized in a review was extremely difficult for all sorts of technical reasons. So we finished up saying, um, on, on emotional attachment, we made some general comments about what might help and the sort of events that don't help, such as uh, experience of a traumatic birth that the mothers had or poor parenting in the mothers and or the father's own childhood. It was interesting, it's a very important area and we weren't able to say anything very clearly about it. Something about illness in babies, which I will talk about. One thing to say about this is we were told by NICE that when we write our recommendations, they don't want us to write a textbook. And some of what we wrote came rather close to writing a textbook. It's a sort of slightly difficult distinction to make. And uh, a lot, finally, a lot on infant feeding that again, Nina is going to talk about at greater length with lots of different sections. Okay. Um, I think that's all. Well, I want to say for the moment. So Nina's going to take over at this point, I think. Yeah. Yes. Thank you very much, David. So as David has uh, suggested, we, we had a number of numerous uh, discussions based on evidence and synthesizing how that should look like in clinical practice, but also some with no evidence. So. I'll, go, I'll pick out some of the more um, poignant ones for you. And, and just to say, um, I was the topic advisor on this guideline. So David and I met at a very early stage of the guideline and we actually were involved in bringing the other committee members together. So um, we'll be kind of joined from the beginning. So David and I have known each other quite a long time now through this. Um, but going back to the guidelines, so in relation to the organization and delivery of postnatal care, uh, the key principles here, what was recognized is how the communication takes place between the clinicians. And in this instance, and particularly around discharge and handover between midwife and health physician services. So the key principle, as you can see here, are that it should be timely, we should give them relevant information. And that's in the responsibility for the maternity services to make sure that the information includes, as you can see, 
both medical and social history for the mum, uh, mum and baby's well-being at the time, the mental health pre-existing, if there are any, and the current and also in relation to feeding. Next of kin sound, may sound a bit odd, but what we have recognized is that when you refer and transfer women out into different areas, there is often no next of kin, and that's quite a key person to have, whoever that uh, woman chooses that person should be. Clear communication of transfer between the clinicians um, we identified as being key, and I'm sure those clinicians will recognize that. Uh, but one thing that is emphasized in this guideline is that the woman and her partner should also be informed about this and be made aware of the transfer that that's happening in terms of handover between one from one professional to the other. The next slide is around home visiting. This is an interesting one. As you can see, um, we made recommendations on the first visit when that should take place for a midwife following discharge from the hospital, from the hospital setting, uh, also the health visitor. Now, when we looked at the evidence, there was some little evidence on the area around midwives visiting and there were numerous um, evidence but they weren't really strong uh, mainly because they were uh, covering variety of contacts um, but what we then discussed within the group um, and the committee was that uh, based given that there was little evidence around this and based on the opinion of the experience of the committee members we identified that the first visit should take around, well, no more than 36 hours after transfer to make sure that we do identify any early concerns. But also we recognize that this should be face-to-face -face and usually at the woman's home, um, unless the woman has uh, other preferences. And I, we, we actually put the face-to-face -face in there because we recognize that with the development of uh, technology and digital health, um, having that face-to-face um, -face contact to be able to assess is at the first point is actually quite critical. So, so that's why that's left there. When it comes to the health visiting, we found no evidence uh, following the search in relation to when that should take place, that visit. We, as um, Health visitor colleagues may know that the Healthy Child Programme does suggest that two postnatal visits should take place by the health visitor following birth. And um, we know that that generally takes place around uh, the kind of the first week after the transfer of care from the midwifery care to the um, health visiting. But what we wanted to do just to delay that a bit to make sure that there isn't a large gap from um, day 10 or seven until six to eight weeks um, follow up, which it would be the next one that they will see the visit health visitors. So based on that, we um, the recommendation does suggest it should take place between seven and 14 days, unless, um, although the caveat there is if the woman hasn't had any antenatal visit by the health visitor, then that can be actually a bit sooner. So those are the kind of the discussion, just to give you a bit of a flavor of what discussions were taking place. The other aspect um, I wanted to point out is in relation to the postnatal care um, of the woman. And perineal health is the one that was very new for many, not in the sense that this is not a problem, but actually we felt that that needs to be highlighted. Um, as a result, they, um, and, and mainly because we, the, there was a recognition, particularly by our, our obstetric colleagues, that this is an area that has not been recognized. And we know that perineal pain and its complications are often overlooked. And they're falsely considered to be part of the normal postnatal healing. And we know that early identification and management of pain may prevent long-term consequences for the woman, uh, both in terms of physical health, but also in terms of her experience of the postnatal care. So this recommendations are particularly around uh, practice, giving practical advice about how to maintain good perineal hygiene, 
and looking at validated pain score that may help to identify the level of the intensity of the pain that the woman's experiencing, but also refers to um, physical examination to determine the severity of the cause of the pain. One particular recommendations within that is that the any wound breakdown should be urgently referred to the appropriate clinician. Um, and as you can see here, the, the woman needs to be advised about the pain relief and in particular um, the clinicians or practitioners attending the woman, which in that case would be the midwife mostly, need to be mindful of the risk factors that can exacerbate that pain, particularly in relation to the type of birth uh, that the woman may have had. The GP visits I put there because that is something because I'm sure most clinicians will know that is a bit of ad hoc, but this guideline does actually refer to this and, and does recommend that the six to eight weeks um, GP referral, should, GP assessment should take place and the GP should take a thorough assessment, both physical um, assess the mental and emotional well-being of the mother and the baby and in order to identify any concerns on refer when appropriate. So those are the two things that I wanted to cover, particularly in relation to this. The infant feeding is an interesting one. One of the biggest change for us within this committee was that for the first time, there was a recognition that the infant feeding, it starts from antenatal care and follows on through after the baby's delivered. So the, for the first time, this is quite unique that antenatal information sits within the postnatal care guideline. And actually the infant feeding section covers both antenatal and postnatal part of the infant feeding. And what you find is in the new antenatal update uh, guideline that's due at very soon, there won't be any reference made to infant feeding all of it is within the postnatal care. So it's just helpful for you to know when you are looking at any information around it. So the infant feeding covers both breastfeeding as well as um, bottle feeding. The general principles are fairly similar uh, in relation to acknowledging the parents, emotional, social, financial, and environmental concerns about uh, feeding options. The environmental concerns are actually quite new for this one. And also be respectful of parents' choices. Um, I've put, given information about breastfeeding, there is a section about bottle feeding as well. And the kind of the information given part is fairly similar. In relation to the breastfeeding is uh, just to give information about nutritional benefit for the baby. And the reason for that is that there was some good evidence that women are motivated by many benefits of breastfeeding. Therefore, it is important to share that information with the women. And also there was evidence that women felt they were able to soothe and comfort the baby by breastfeeding. So therefore, these are quite important, very simple messages to get across to the woman from antenatal period and continue that throughout that um, journey of, of giving birth. So um, there were lengthy discussions and as, as I said the committee agreed that antenatal period is the right time to start giving that information. And the, the other point that is quite new within this guideline is that the, um, the women uh, should be informed that there are benefits of breastfeeding, even if they choose to do so for a short period of time, as all the clinicians know, particularly around the cholesterol and the benefits that that has. Um, also is new is around information given uh, to the partner to support the breastfeeding, because it's recognised that the family and, and that core um, people around the woman will have an impact and be able to support. And, and the reason for that is both in relation to the value of their involvement and support and how they can comfort and bond with the baby. And um, it was interesting, some of the evidence was suggesting that some women and their families believe that bottle feeding was a way for the baby to bond with the partner. And that's why um, the recommendation does suggest that parents, expectant parents should be informed about alternative ways to comfort bond with a baby if the mother chooses to, to breastfeed. And I think this is quite an important point to highlight in that. Um, I think if, um, 
sorry, David, if you just move on. Oh, to sorry. The next yeah. slide. I think the, um, again, just some key principles around the breastfeeding and which is around supporting women to breastfeed and that around the technique, as we all know, in terms of positioning. The face-to-face -face support here, again, is, is highlighted as that is an integral part of the care that we provide rather than just purely consider a virtual uh, media to do that because the virtual media within this context is seen as a supplementary support rather than the key uh, way of providing support and also the information should not only be given to the woman and the partner and uh, or whoever ha is the guardian uh, or is involved in that baby's care needs to have that information and that's a theme running throughout the um, the guideline if you look at it that the the responsible person for the baby as soon as the baby is born it needs to be involved in that information given to understand to be able to support their family information about peer support was uh, mentioned as being a very important part and also we we talk about within the recommendations around responsive feeding and that and, and signs of effective feed and that actually both is in relation to bottle feeding as well as breastfeeding. And again, uh, how to recognize any complications and concern and when to seek help. And it does interestingly, we felt it was important to highlight the practitioners who are offering the support need to have the right skills and competency to be able to assess and identify the concerns. I mean, one of the things that David mentioned rightly uh, around lactation suppression, which is a new, um, point within this guideline and uh, interestingly enough we didn't find much evidence about what level of information we should give women when it comes to lactation suppression and um, and what support they need so, so the recommendation around that particular one around uh, lactation suppression is based on the committee's knowledge expertise and experience and although I haven't put it up here, but I think it's just worth noting that around lactation suppression, there is a recommendation that that needs to be discussed with women if they're not uh, decided not to breastfeed, if they have stopped breastfeeding, if the breastfeeding is contraindicated, and I think it's recognized, it's, it's important to recognize that the number of group of women will fall into this category. And also in the event of uh, the baby's death, which is a very sad event. And it is just to make sure that it's not automatic in this is falls on the clinician's responsibility to be able to share and discuss that information with the parents and the woman. And the topic that they, the recommendation uh, suggests should be discussed is around how body produces milk, what happens when it stops? How does it, uh, how does that process, how long does that take? And some information around self-health advice, around supportive bra, avoid stimulating the breast and using ice pack, very simple, but very effective uh, tips. And also when to seek help and the medicines that can be prescribed to, to help with the suppression, uh, suppressing the lactations and also the disadvantages and advantages of various methods as available, but also um, last but not least around the pain relief option that the woman has. And I think that's quite a new uh, feature within this, within this guideline and is definitely worth looking at. And I think uh, I hand over to you, David, if that's... Um... Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> so I'm going to deal with, uh, I think, just a couple of items which we thought would be of interest. Um, bed sharing came up rather interesting at the scoping exercise. It didn't feature very largely. And uh, when it went out to consultation, somebody came back, a number of people came back and said, no, no, this is terribly important. You must, you must have this one in. So we included it and it turns out that there's plenty of evidence on this and writing the recommendations when there was really good, quite good, reliable evidence wasn't very difficult. And it turns out to the surprise of some of us and against some of the things that are going around in, uh, in, among professionals, I think, that 
we have no reason to tell people not to share their beds with their newborns. Turns out that, uh, that bed sharing is reasonably safe, provided that a number of things happen. Uh, um, and uh, I've listed them here. Not a not preterm or low birth weight baby. Provided, of course, as you know, the baby is on their back on a flat, firm surface. Um, that you do this on a bed and not a sofa. It's thought, I think, when I asked about this, that sofas are too soft and you can sink into them. Um, uh, but also, I noticed when I was handling a, a very newborn grandson uh, a week or so ago. And he was asleep on me. He was asleep on his front and I was sitting on the sofa. I thought, oh, yes, if I fell asleep now, that would not be a good idea. Uh, and my daughter-in-law told me very, very, very sternly that I wasn't to fall asleep. Well, that was all right. Nothing to make you drowsy. No alcohol, no drugs, and actually no smoking. I haven't put that in. And they say keep pillows and duvets away from the babies because, again, this is something that might lead to them heating up. And the worry is, of course, that, that something might happen uh, which would cause an unexpected death. I did think today when I was writing this, that's an interesting instruction, that if you have to keep pillows and duvets away from the babies, how, how easy is, this, is it to share the bed with them? Actually, I don't know. I, I'd, I'd have to try that out, and I really don't know. One of the reasons, I'd forgotten again to include this on the slide, but one of the reasons was that the expert, the person who was expert on the committee, but who didn't help write the recommendations because of the rules said, of course, one of the things to remember is that this is the norm in many countries in the world that the babies share the bed of the parents for the first whatever. So that's bed sharing. And then we agreed I was going to talk about symptoms and signs of illness in babies. This was quite difficult. Um, partly because of the way the questions were asked, and we had to go back and repeat something. But we're all pleased to see that right at the top, it says, under this section, it says, respond to the parent's concern. If the parents are worried the baby's ill, listen and take it seriously. Now, it may sound completely obvious to experienced professionals that that's what you do. But again, for all sorts of reasons, it doesn't always happen. And the other thing is, respond to your own concern. So, um, down to red flags in the moment, but um, even, if, even if there are no obvious red flags that this, that this baby shows, if something's telling you this isn't right, you trust that judgment. We have... Uh, very, very good academic primary care doctors in the Netherlands. And they, a group of them have been working for some time on gut feelings. And they've come to the conclusion that doctors' gut feelings are pretty good. Um, I find that difficult, but they, are, they have lots of good evidence to, to support it. And one of the bits of evidence is, of course, it gets better as you, uh, as you get a bit older. Although, of course, when I asked a colleague, um, whether you get to a peak, he looked at me and said, oh yes, you're way over the peak. But, it, but, the, but the notion of gut feeling is something not to be laughed at. We also have recommended judicious use of the baby check um, uh, assessment tool. Um, baby check has been in existence a long time and has been ignored up till now. Again, I was amazed uh, when my daughter-in-law had her first baby is that she wasn't introduced to this. And I hope this will now happen. It's not like nothing. Nothing is 100% reliable. Baby check is not 100% reliable. But it may help both parents and professionals to, to come to a judgment as to whether this baby is really ill or just a little bit off. Um, the baby check is available on the Lullaby Trust's website. And some of us think it's pretty good. It's certainly better than nothing. Some of the things we discussed, which are worth just, which I've just highlighted. There's a whole long list of stuff here. And I've put absence of fever in neonates. It's really important not to regard fever as a sort of sine qua non of something that babies have to have if they had sepsis. 
Neonates can have really nasty infections and show no rise or even a fall in infection. This is really important. What we did find from the review is that you cannot put any weight on individual symptoms, either them being present or absent. That the just nothing will carry that weight, which is why, um, which is why you have to take an overall assessment and trust your own feelings. And then despite that, we were asked to, and therefore have included a list of red flags. Um, uh, I, I think that's slightly inconsistent. But again, if you need that, it, it reads at this point a bit like a, a textbook, but we were asked to include it and so we have. And there is a lot, there are a lot of them. Again, you won't want to consult that every time you see a sick baby, but it's something just to look at occasionally and try and remind yourself of what is and is not there. So that was all we wanted to say uh, in detail about the recommendations. But I have personally, so these are mine, these aren't really Nina's and they're not really the, uh, the, the judgment of the committee, although I think the committee would mostly agree with, with some of this. But these are my conclusions at the end of all this work. There are two fundamental truths about postnatal care. The first one is that it's multidisciplinary. Now, Nina's talked about the importance of communication and making sure that you pass on the information to the next in line. Um, but I think you just, it, it's really important to make sure people know. So even if somebody introduces, one of the things that I fear may happen is that trusts will in, introduce some form that you fill in and tick boxes and things. Mm. And my own personal view is there is no substitute for direct face-to-face -face contact with your colleagues and say, look, this is what I'm worried about. I've been really lucky through my professional, very long, as Susan said, my very long professional career that I've always worked very closely with both midwives and health visitors, learned an awful lot from both groups. And to be able just to go upstairs and, and talk to them is fantastic. The other thing about it being um, multidisciplinary is that there's a sense, it came out at a conference, a meeting I was at a year or two back, there's a sense that nobody is really in charge. And I suspect that's one of the reasons that it's a kind of Cinderella service, that there isn't a powerful group saying, this is really, really important to us and to our patients. Um, and I think that makes it more difficult for, for the women and their babies. Um, one, of the, uh, one of the recommendations I think Nina didn't touch on was that women need to be given information about what to expect all the time, what to expect, and whom to, whom to contact when things are going wrong. And of course, the period, in, the postnatal period, however you much you, you shorten it to, even if it's only six weeks, a huge amount changes in that time. And an awful lot will change about whom to contact when things are going wrong. And it's one thing I think we really have to, have to work at. And I've said here, we all have to find out how to work together. I read a, a, an email, of another group I'm in, where people talk about integrated working. And somebody wrote and said, integrated working works very well when the organizing committees get together and write a document. But that isn't integrated working. It's people on the, on the ground floor, the people at primary care level actually working together. And that's really important. The other thing I think that is really fundamental truth is that what makes postnatal care difficult, different, and I think slightly difficult, is that most of the time, most of the people you see are not going to encounter problems. And your job, our job, is to help them adjust to, to a life change and to help them to adjust to a new person in the family and all of that. And that's true for second, third babies, as well as it is for first babies. But at the same time as doing that and listening to them and trying to support them, we also have to spot the abnormal. And actually, keeping those two things balanced isn't terribly easy. It's a great challenge. I love it. Or I used to love it. Don't do it anymore. But it, it, it is a challenge. And so the last conclusion I want to just hand to you is, the committee were fantastic. They all said all the time 
the important thing is to listen to the individuals. And some of that has come out from what Nina's presented. But it ran like a sort of thread through the whole of all of our deliberations. And it sort of comes out a little in bits and pieces in the guideline. Um, I was prevented from saying it in very bold headline letters right at the top. One of the things that NICE, I think, where NICE, I think is changing a little bit is for many years, they've been issuing guidelines and the sense from them and lots of clinicians is okay, this is what NICE tell us to do and we must do it. But people like me have complained and said, no, no, you have to listen to the patients and take into account their values and their beliefs and their expectations. And I did check earlier today, NICE does now have some guidance on shared decision-making. So that whatever you do with this guideline, don't apply it blindly. You have to try and apply it, use what's there, but make sure you listen to the patient and, and follow them as much as you can and as much as is gonna help them. And that <laughs> is all I have to say. Thank you all very much for listening. Thanks for watching this video from the Maternity and Midwifery Forum. For more expert opinion and analysis, hit the button below to subscribe.